introduction of what the basal ganglia is. Um, we learned a little about it in school. It's a group of nuclei that's in the cortex, uh, made up of five different nuclei. And basically, the basal ganglia is going to be involved in helping regulate motor function. As you can see here in the picture, the cortex is going to, when it gets information about motor and somatomotor and sensory functions, it goes to the basal ganglia on the same side, ipsilaterally, it comes back up and refines that movement to be used by that same cortex. This could be right, this could be left. And there are four different types of pathways that run parallel to each other. So here is the basic schematic of the, how the basal ganglia works, but there's actually four different functionality pathways that are running through the same exact system. They just run side by side. And they're listed here. The main one is motor output, which when you have basal ganglia lesions, that can be one of the biggest signs is some motor dysfunction, which we're going to go over. Uh, there's also problems with eye movements that can show up through the oculomotor pathway. Cognition, also premotor functions in the frontal cortex area are involved in the basal ganglia. And emotionality, uh, also the basal ganglia gets limbic input, so it also involves aspects of limbic system function. Um, what is the main function of the basal ganglia? It's to inhibit the thalamus. So when I get motor and sensorimotory input into my cortex and it goes to the basal ganglia, basically there's going to be some signals sent to the thalamus to inhibit some of those motor sensory functions so that only the very important one for that particular moment is expressed. Uh, better explained, if I were to pick up a cup and bring it to my lips, I'm contracting some muscles like my bicep, maybe my brachioradialis, maybe some of my shoulder muscles. What the basal ganglia does is it inhibits all the rest of the muscles around me. So say my extensors want to fire during this motion, the basal ganglia will inhibit those areas in order to just focus on that one functionality of raising the cup to my lip. And that's called surround inhibition, that's also in the packet. Basically you're inhibiting all the surrounding muscles. So, inhibiting motor output, surrounding condition. We're going to talk a little bit and try and learn the pathway a little. It can be kind of demanding, it can be a little bit scary looking at it, but there's some simple rules to look at. First, let me point out that this top pathway is the indirect. Um, actually, no, that's not right. This one is the direct one, that's superior, and this one is the indirect. So, we're just going to run through this really quickly and then talk a little bit about ways to remember it. So with the direct input, you're getting excitatory function from the cortex up here. And both pathways start with this, with this rule that you can see from helpful hints that all input into the basal ganglia, these structures here, is going to be excitatory. So you're exciting the putamen, and then from there, the second rule is all output from the, um, from the basal ganglia Putamen, globus pallus, externa, interna, it's all inhibitory. So leaving this structure right here, you're only going to see red inhibitory lines. Now, how does it inhibit the thalamus? The direct pathway is what inhibits the thalamus, and it does this by causing two, two outputs. First it goes in the putamen, and then you have an inhibitory output to the globus pallus interna. And I guess the best way, the easiest way to look at this is to start backwards, start from the thalamus, and this is the main output to the thalamus. It's going to be inhibitory. But in the direct pathway, you have a previous inhibition from the putamen. So even though you're inhibiting the thalamus through the GPI, you look back here, this area is being inhibited by the putamen. So we've talked about this in the past. Inhibition of inhibition, of inhibition equals citation. So if you see two red lines, that lets you know that excitation is going to come because this inhibition is inhibiting by another structure. So the direct pathway turns on the thalamus, excites it, and that's going to cause expression of motor function. The indirect pathway, you have inhibition of inhibition here, but what that's inhibiting is down here, the subthalamic nuclei. It's all listed for you, but if we have this inhibition of inhibition over here, and the subthalamic nuclei is allowed to fire, that's going to excite the GPI. And remember, the main function of the globus pallus internus is to inhibit the thalamus. 
So now, if this is allowed to fire and excite the GPI, you will inhibit the thalamus. So basically, to sum that up, direct pathway excites the thalamus through this process. The indirect inhibits the thalamus. And the inhibitory pathway, the indirect pathway, is really the one that's dominantly functioning. Both pathways are functioning at the same time, but indirect pathway is the majority of the time has a greater output. So overall, this causes the main function of the thalamus, to, of, the, of the basal ganglia to be inhibition of the thalamus. Okay? And when this whole system is a little messed up, we tend to have problems. Uh, some of the problems that can occur is hyperkinesia. Hyperkinesia, basically, if you don't have enough inhibition of thalamic activity, then you're going to have involuntary movements start to come out. And you can tell from the basal ganglia, especially if, if there's a lesion, if this happens when your body's at rest. So if my body's at rest and I'm not moving any muscles, and you start to see some twitching or some excitation of muscles that shouldn't be activating, that lets you know that the thalamus is being excited, it's not being inhibited, so that might be a basal ganglia problem. Okay, so as you can read, it says patient uh, displays involuntary movements, it could be shakes, it could be in the form of tremors, at rest, and caused by lack of thalamic inhibition. Or it could be the other way around. Um, to explain hypokinesia, I'm also going to just draw one little quick pathway out. The key here is that Although this goes straight to the thalamus, this inhibitory neuron actually has collaterals that go to other parts of the body. So I'm going to draw the first one. It goes down and causes inhibition of the substantia nigra compacta. The important function of the substantia nigra, this is the key here, is that it's going to loop around and it's going to affect both pathways. It affects them a little differently, though. The uh, substantia nigra is going to excite the indirect pathway and inhibit the indirect pathway. And this also has dopamine in it. It's a dopaminergic pathway. Dopamine. So when dopamine decreases in the system, due to some dysfunctions and disorders like Parkinson's disease is the one we talk about a lot in school, it's going to cause you to have, I'm oh, sorry, let me back up a little bit. Substantia nigra, when it fires, it's going to excite the direct pathway. So substantia nigra is kind of responsible for overriding the indirect system and causing that voluntary movement when you need it. Is that correct, Julie? Something like that. So when you have the substantia nigra going, you're going to excite the direct pathway more and cause more inhibition to the indirect system, allowing for movement. But when this starts to go awry, when we start to lose dopamine uh, due to some disease processes or other problems, lesions in the, in the uh, basal ganglia, we start to get we start to get too much inhibition. We start to get the direct pathway starts to get cut, and the indirect pathway becomes the predominant pathway to the point where it basically stops moving from occurring. Am I saying that right? So, so you have decreased motion because you no longer have dopamine to excite the direct pathway. So we already said the indirect pathway is dominant, but now it's just super dominant. You have way too much inhibition, so you're going to have lack of motion. And that can be expressed when someone is trying to start moving. They might have a lot of rigidity and it takes them a little while to get started walking. So that would be seen in hypokinesia. Um, but either pathway could get messed up. The direct pathway, if it's messed up, there's too much inhibition. If the indirect pathway is messed up, you have excitation, too much involuntary motion. And that's why I put hemibolismus down there. Um, if the indirect pathway is messed up and there's too much excitation, the other side of the body, contralaterally, you're going to have flailing of the arm or too much excitation. This can be seen over here when I showed you before how the basal ganglia loops up to the cortex. Once it loops up to the cortex and the sensory fibers come down, they're going to cross the medulla and have function on the contralateral side of the body. So if there's a basal ganglia lesion, 
It's usually going to be expressed on the contralateral side of the body. And some things that you might also see for symptoms and signs is rigidity. I have down lead pipe rigidity. And as it says, there are some different types of rigidity. Sometimes you have the rigidity where you're flexing your arm and you're trying to put pressure on it to extend it. And after a little while, it goes limp. That's usually with an upper motor neuron lesion, uh, upper motor neuron lesion. But with basal ganglia destruction, you're going to have what's called lead pipe rigidity, where it stays super tense. So you might try and pull the arm down, you might try and move the arm, but it's basically like a solid piece of lead. Um, or there's other ones, cog wheel rigidity. Also, you could have cognitive and limbic dis decline. Um, because the basal ganglia is decreased, you might have problems with the other systems that loop into the basal ganglia. So cognition might go down, they might have a lack, lack of memory, their planning and executive functions might decrease because that's controlled by the prefrontal cortex. And limbic problems, they might start to get angry or excited a lot because the limbic pathway that runs through the basal ganglia is on the decline, it's not firing when it should be. And that could cause problems in terms of outrageous bursts or just ill-tempered with the spouse. So, how can we correct this imbalance? Um, if anyone wants to turn